Thanks, Niraj, for getting, um, getting us started off today with uh, a lot of food for thought to think about there and, and to the audience for some excellent questions. So um, next we're moving on to uh, Dr. Maria Polyakova, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Stanford University. Um, so I've noticed I've, I've put the two West Coast speakers um, talking first and then the East Coast speakers come later. I apologize to the West Coast speakers having to, to make you wake up so early um, to, to give your talks, but, but so far it's, it's it's been going well. So if you were here two years ago, you might remember David Howard came uh, to speak about drug prices and in particular um, cancer medications. And uh, so, so we are coming back to look at uh, drugs ag again. Um, they, they are, you know, in a, a very, it's a very timely issue in terms of everyone is concerned about the high prices of drugs. But this, this talk you're going to see is also taking a broader picture, which is this notion of um, Medicare Part D is, is a relatively new program, and it's, um, it's come with a lot of new changes in the market and how um, private insurers have entered this market. And so it's helpful in terms of considering the structure of this program to decide how we can design health care reform um, not only within Medicare Part D, but beyond Medicare Part D for, for other parts of insurance coverage. And I think you'll, you'll see that from, um, from the talk today. So, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Maria. Uh, thank you so much, Vivian, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So when uh, thinking about this talk and sort of the task that Vivian gave me was to talk about something about drugs and Medicare Part D and how it could relate to healthcare reform, um, I think I, you know, had two choices. Basically, either one could talk about drug prices, and it sounds like uh, that has been the topic here two years ago, or one could think about Medicare Part D as sort of, it is a pharmaceutical insurance program, but a lot of the structure of the program relates very tightly to how um, the ACA marketplaces are structured um, in terms of how you organize this insurance marketplace. And so given the kind of healthcare reform topic of the conference today, I decided to not focus on drug pricing, but rather look within the Medicare Part D program and see what we can learn from it in uh, informing, uh, in informing the healthcare reform. Um, so with that, let's see. Okay. Um, just to give you a, a general kind of setting that I'm going to um, uh, think about here. So if you think about developed countries, OECD countries, in principle, prescription drugs are always somehow tightly related to what the government does. So the public um, policymaker or regulators play an important role in drug pricing and drug availability in general. There are two aspects that are very distinct that you usually think, when you usually think about the role of government in prescription drug um, uh, setting, and that is one is the safety and market access regulation, and that is not something I'm going to cover today, but that is a very important topic. And the second question is how um, are drug, drugs financed, so basically who pays what for drugs, how much they cost, uh, how much they cost and who bears this cost. So ultimately, at the end of the day, there is a lot of variation in how insurance is, uh, or how these payment structures are, uh, work across different countries, but they all boil down to some form of insurance. And there's been a lot of debate that you know goes back and forth in the US also, whether this insurance should be private or public or a mixture of the two. So um, today I'm going to think about Medicare Part D experience, which has this unique feature that is going to be uh, essentially private insurance in the sense that it is administered by private health insurance companies, but at the same time, a lot of financing of the program comes from the government. So it's going to be the mixture of public and private, and I think we can, that in that sense, it is very similar to the Affordable Care Act um, exchanges, and I think we can learn a lot from this program, especially in light of the fact that for the exchanges themselves, we actually don't have any data, while Medicare Part D has very good data. Um, okay, before we go there, I was, uh, must say I didn't know any of these facts really myself, but for preparing this talk, I was curious, you know, people often ask why did prescription drug spending um, started being covered in Medicare so late? So as many of you may know, Medicare Part D was introduced in 2006. What were seniors doing before that? So it turns out if you actually read the, uh, the regulatory documents from 1965 when Medicare came about, there was originally a plan to cover pharmaceuticals. 
Um, but then, you know, while the law was going through various um, uh, stages, it was dropped. The pharmaceutical coverage was dropped, and kind of the, the reason on paper, at least, was that uh, the costs of drugs were too uncertain and potentially too high for the program to kind of sign up on this generous coverage on the drugs. And then throughout the various years, there have been a lot of attempts to introduce pharmaceutical coverage into Medicare, and it didn't really fully succeed until 2003, um, where under the Medicare Modernization Act, there was this Medicare Part D program that was introduced, and that was the largest expansion of Medicare. Um, in the 2000s. The program was fully implemented in 2006, and as I've already mentioned, it had this quite unique design. So if uh, many of you are familiar, I'm guessing, with uh, traditional Medicare, so just to uh, re reiterate how Medicare works, in some sense you can think about Medicare as actually uh, two big pieces. So there is Medicare that is paid directly by the government, so-called traditional Medicare, and that is uh, our fee-for-service Medicare, and a lot of seniors have that coverage. Alternatively, seniors can choose to be in plans that are called Medicare Advantage, which are effectively a private replica of traditional Medicare, and are plans offered by firms you would all be familiar with, like Humana, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Cigna, and so forth. So these are regular insurance companies that are offering Medicare Medicare coverage, and Medicare pays these insurance companies to do that. So Medicare Part D was unique in that there was no this traditional or government-run part. So all of Medicare Part D is operated by private insurance companies. Um, and uh, however, at the same time, it is uh, quite tightly regulated and heavily subsidized by Medicare. So this is an example of this uh, trend that we're seeing more and more that essentially, instead of providing insurance coverage directly, uh, public funds are used to set up a market, essentially, where private insurers operate, but the public payer doesn't uh, cover services directly. Instead, it pays private insurance companies. So as I've mentioned, the government plays a very important role in Medicare Part D, even though it is provided by private firms. And you can see this on this, uh, using this very straightforward calculation. Wait, did I have a, this, there is no, there is no point, I guess. Um, so average premiums in Medicare Part D, they vary a lot, but in principle you can kind of, it's useful to think about them as being on the order of $500, but average spending on drugs in the enrolled population is about $2,000 per year. So of course the only way this program can work is if someone pays $1,500 per year for these people, and that uh, happens to be uh, the government, um, which results in about $80 billion um, uh, dollars of annual federal spending on Medicare Part D, which, as Niraj already pointed out, is on the order of 10 to 15 percent spending of um, Medicare. Importantly, even though Medicare uh, sort of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that administers Medicare plays an important role in funding this. As I've already um, mentioned, Medicare doesn't actually uh, participate in the setting of prices for drugs. So that's an important controversial point about this program that has been debated a lot. So, so Medicare Part D plans have to negotiate these drug prices by themselves. Um, but, and, and, and people, including people in this room, have, uh, have done a lot of work looking at, at that aspect. I'm going to leave drug pricing out of this talk for today, but I think in general it's a very interesting um, topic. Okay, so if I'm going to leave out drug pricing, what is it that there is to talk about uh, in Medicare Part D? And it turns out that there are lots and lots of things. Um, so I'm going to uh, group the topics that one you know, issues that one can learn about from Medicare Part D into three broad categories. So first is consumer choices. What we will see in Medicare that Part D that is quite unique is that people will be facing a lot of uh, different plans so we can learn about, you know, behavior of, of consumers when they are, when they do find themselves in this marketplace where they face a lot of choices. Um, second is insurer behavior, and that is also something quite unique about the Medicare Part D program, because unlike employer-sponsored coverage, where in principle it is the employer who drives the design of plans, in Medicare Part D we really have these private insurers who have to come up with their own plan design, and so we can learn from this program as to what exactly insurers end up doing uh, when they're giving the scope to design their plans. 
And finally, the third bucket or the third theme here is what does the government do? So I think my view of the role of government in Medicare Part D, and that is, I think, similar to the Affordable Care Act exchanges, is essentially the government here is, is, is playing the role of a market maker, right? So they, the government is designing a marketplace. It sets forth regulatory rules and payment flows um, and some rules about how you can price and what products you have to offer, and then it kind of gives this market to private insurers and consumers and says, and says you know, you go uh, uh, sort of figure out uh, how it works exactly. Um, and so one important um, part of this market making role is, uh, is actually designing subsidies in Medicare Part D program, and that is something I'm going to talk at the um, end of, the, of this presentation. So. The challenge here is on the one hand, I want to give uh, you a flavor of all of these different aspects of the program. At the same time, that would take much more than 40 minutes. So what I'm going to do is kind of tell you three short stories, if you wish, that falls into each of these um, baskets. They totally don't give justice to a very large and rich literature that has been uh, written in all of these three uh, areas, but hopefully just give you a sense of the kinds of questions that arise in Medicare Part D, but also in the ACA exchanges and the complexity um, that, that, we face, um, that we face there. Okay, so let's think about the first story on consumer choices. Um, so as I've mentioned, Medicare Part D gives you this unique environment where people are choosing among many plans, and it gives us a chance to study how consumers navigate choices in health insurance. So in Medicare Part D, if you want to kind of have a number, th this, um, this number changed a lot throughout the existence of the program, but approximately seniors often have to choose among more than 30 plans, and in principle, they're supposed to be making these choices every year. These plans, even though most of them only cover pharmaceutical drugs, so this has nothing to do with going to the doctor or going to a hospital, uh, these plans are very complex. So there are formularies that list which drugs are covered by the program. There are various cost-sharing arrangements. Um, the plans may have, the formularies may include various step therapies and other management, uh, utilization management features. So in the academic literature and also in the public debate, there's been a lot of concern that people may um, uh, that this kind of proliferation of plans may be confusing, and CMS has done a lot to try to reduce the number of plans, asking them to really explain if you're, uh, if you're an insurer who's offering multiple plans, what are the difference between these plans? You have to be quite clear about that. Um, and uh, there is a lot, li large literature that has been written saying, you know, people um, seem to be not necessarily making the most optimal choice, but maybe they're choosing thing, their choices are improving over time. And um, on the other hand, people have found that actually seniors are not really switching plans that often. So about 90% of people don't actually change their plans over time, which you may imagine in some sense if the idea is to put pressure on insurers to improve their plan design or negotiate but the drug prices through consumer shopping, it's hard to call consumer shopping an environment where most people never really change their plans. So there are all of these challenges. What, one aspect that I think has received a little bit less attention because it's potentially less detrimental in Medicare Part D, but I think is very important in ACA exchanges, and that's the idea of risk selection. So um, one aspect of having consumer choice in a, in a health insurance environment is, as Niraj discussed, people who are healthier are, will have a tendency to enroll in less generous plans, and people who are sicker will have a tendency to enroll in more generous plans. And as a result of that, you may have un so-called unraveling or this effect of adverse selection that economists worry about a lot. And that is that essentially the prices for very generous plans are going to be rising um, every single year, and people who are kind of the healthiest of the sickest people are going to be dropping out of this uh, generous coverage, and at the end of the day, the generous coverage may unravel. Um, and there are a lot of kind of policy tools that, uh, that are used to counteract this. So the first question, though, is if we are concerned that people are potentially confused by pr proliferation of these plans, maybe we can think, well, this is great, because if everyone is choosing at random in, in, in sort of in, in the limit, then maybe there is no adverse selection. So at least we, we have to worry then about how people choose, but then, there is no, but then there is no selection if people were choosing at random. So that turns out not to be the case. Um, 
people are clearly not choosing randomly, even in this very complex environment. So what I'm plotting here is I'm taking data from Medicare Part D program. And on the x-axis here, I'm plotting average annual spending on pharmaceuticals. So not out-of-pocket spending, but sort of your total spending on pharmaceuticals. And I'm dividing this, so the different uh, triangles and dots here, I'm dividing that uh, into four types of plans. And um, on the vertical axis here, you just have different Medicare Part D markets, which you can think about as states. So that's just making a point that this applies kind of across the country. So what this graph is showing you is the very uh, left hand side dots and triangles. Um, this is the average uh, pharmaceutical expenditure in plans that are least generous. So these are plans that have usually a deductible and they have the so-called uh, donut hole or, cover or, or gap in coverage that is, has been kind of a typical feature of Medicare Part D that I'll touch on a little bit later. On the very right hand side, you see plans that are the most generous plans. So those plans usually have no deductible and they have very generous coverage in the donut hole. And what you can see happening here is across all states in the US, consumers who are enrolled in plans that have the most generous coverage end up spending about four times as much on average on their drugs than people who enroll in plans uh, that are least generous. So this is very suggestive of adverse selection. However, for those of you in the academic audience, like Niraj could point out, well, but if these people face you know, no deductibles, they may just be spending more. So to convince you that this is really driven by risk selection rather than response to more generous coverage, what I do here, and this is potentially a less intuitive graph, I apologize for that, but essentially it is just plotting the same thing, but now instead of plotting an average, I'm plotting the whole distribution of consumers in each of these types of plans. Um, and what you can see here, here I'm taking not their average drug spending, but rather constructing a spending proxy from their conditions. So it's essentially measuring, are people that have more chronic conditions, which has nothing to do with whether they have a deductible in their prescription drug plan, are those people more likely to enroll in more generous plans? Is the, and the answer is yes. So essentially what we see here is that in this program where we are even worried that people may not be ch making optimal choices, even in this environment we do see that uh, consumers end up kind of making smart choices in the sense that if you are sicker, you, you do enroll in more generous plans. Um, okay, well, so should we care? Who cares? In some sense, you can plot pretty pictures, publish it in an economics paper. That's useful for me, I guess, but not really useful for, uh, for the policy discussion. So um, why do we care about selection here? So as Niraj also pointed out, so adverse selection, this idea of people sorting across plans according to their risk, has a strong potential to destabilize markets. Essentially, if everyone who is sick will enroll in the most generous plan, suppose this plan, suppose we're in a perfectly competitive ideal world, this plan just charges everyone the average cost in the plan, this average cost will be rising with every year because more, and more sicker and sicker people enroll in this plan. In the limit, what usually uh, th theory would predict would happen is that all of these plans will end up if they stay in the market, offering only the minimum standard. So minimum standard, which has kind of now people have started debating about a little bit in the context of the ACA, the moment you reduce the required coverage, the minimum required coverage in the plans, in combination with adverse selection, what you can end up if nothing else is done, is that everyone only has the option to enroll in this plan with the minimum standard, and the lower the standard, the less happy you may be about the plan. So we can actually, uh, so Medicare Part D has a lot of uh, policies that are trying to counteract that, but even in this environment, you can actually observe exactly this kind of death spiral of a plan happening in the first two years of the program. So these plans that I showed you that enrolled four times essentially sicker consumers at the very beginning, they actually ceased existence by 2008. So after two years of the program and up, till, up until today, you cannot buy a plan that has full coverage of the donut hole or, or, or has, uh, so all plans have coverage in the gap, uh, meaning uh, that basically the most generous plans unraveled despite the best efforts by CMS to counteract this uh, kind of uh, trend. So what is the role of government here? And I'm going to be coming back to this kind of topic that I guess um, 
uh, uh, Vivian asked me to cover, is, which is the you know, role of government in, in enabling access to pharmaceuticals. So what is the role of government here? Is basically they're trying to counteract the selection spiral in, uh, in Medicare Part D and in the ACA. The programs actually look fairly similar on paper, if not necessarily in practice. So there is uh, risk adjustment, risk orders, reinsurance, all of the various risk equalization programs, and as well as this minimum standard requirements, which are quite important if you think that we're kind of moving in any of these markets towards this minimum standard as the lower bound of coverage that will be um, offered. You know, there is a lot of academic literature saying that these things are potentially imperfect, and that's definitely true. Uh, there has been some in, in attempts to improve, say, risk adjustment in Medicare Part D, but they play a fairly important role in ensuring that it's, it's, it's essentially just the most generous plan that unraveled, but then the other kind of mid-generous plans and least generous plans re remained on the market. Okay, so that's story one about consumer choices and how they interact with selection. Now let me jump a little bit and tell you a second story about insurer behavior. Um, and here, so as you can imagine, these plans in Medicare Part D are quite complex, and hence there are a lot of ways in which insurers could react both to how consumers are behaving on the market, as well as what the government is doing in designing the marketplace. So there are you know, a million different levers that insurers could use. They could uh, set premiums in certain ways. They could try to allocate uh, drugs on their formularies in certain ways. They can uh, change cost sharing. There is a framework, a regulatory framework, that it is set up by CMS that restricts some of what they can do, but it still leaves a lot of um, 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 a lot of potential for insurers to make their own decisions. And um, so in the academic literature, people have looked at these various, um, uh, at this various uh, uh, potential levers that Part D insurers could use in designing their plans. And uh, the literature has indeed documented evidence of sort of strategic prices in response to the fact that people, for example, are not switching plans very often. Then as an insurer, you have an incentive to kind of set prices low at the beginning, attract people, and then potentially raise prices on them um, over time. People have also documented that through drug tiering, insurers are potentially affecting, uh, 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 trying to um, attract healthier beneficiaries or more profitable beneficiaries within the risk equalization programs. Um, there is also at least one paper that I'm familiar with that has thought about how um, putting drugs on, uh, on various tiers may be used by insurance plans as a bargaining tool against pharmaceutical companies where you say essentially, you know, I'm going to put you on a more, uh, on a more uh, generous tier if you give me a better um, uh, rebate. And then um, uh, in addition, there's been work that has shown, um, and that is kind of uh, interesting and uh, again g goes back to some questions that Niraj discussed and then uh, the questions from the audience. So some of Medicare Part D plans are actually integrated with uh, uh, inpatient and outpatient care. So this Medicare Advantage plans actually offer both drug and medical insurance. And uh, there's been work that has documented that in those integrated plans, the insurance companies appear to be setting lower cost sharing for drugs that have a higher potential for medical offsets. So in essence, you know, if we think that taking statins is going to reduce the chance of a heart attack down the line, and if I am a plan that will also have to pay for your heart attack as well as your statins, then I'll have, to, I'll have the incentive to reduce cost sharing for statins so that I don't have to bear the cost of the heart attack, as opposed to traditional or sort of standalone Medicare Part D plans that only cover, uh, only pay for drugs, they don't really care what happens with the heart attack because it's traditional Medicare, fee-for-service Medicare that is gonna pay for it, so they don't have the same incentive to reduce cost sharing for drugs. Um, so in, in this work that I've done with uh, uh, Liran Einov and Amy Finkelstein, we have also looked in, in a di at a different dimension of the same kind of, or, of related idea, which is, um, is it the case that insurers are varying cost sharing for drugs in a way that is related to how responsive consumers are to, uh, to prices of drugs. So how do we think about that? So this is a little bit of a more nerdy slide. I guess it says Ramsey taxation, 
probably that is not really something you're interested in hearing about. But essentially, so part of the discussion, so Niraj already introduced this idea of moral hazard, thank you, that it re redu <laughs> reduces my need to describe it. Um, so if you think about economic theory, which can be uh, kind of boring at times, but uh, still insightful. Uh, so economic theory would suggest that if you have a situation, so imagine a healthcare plan, and people are differentially responsive to prices. So essentially, suppose if I raise prices for going to an emergency department for a heart attack, people still go to the emergency department for a heart attack, like you don't care about prices. Then in that environment, economic theory suggests that you should provide people with full insurance. So there should be no copay, no deductible, no coinsurance if you're not responsive to prices. If you are responsive to prices, on the other hand, we should raise your cost sharing because without that, you would be sort of over consuming that service, okay? So there is this kind of theory guidance that tells us if you write down an economic model of efficiency, and I will give you the caveats of this model in a moment, then you should have higher cost sharing for things that are more responsive to prices. That is in stark contrast to how usually public plans that we can observe, say, in the VA, at, in the US, or in other OECD countries, structure their cost sharing. So in fact, in most public insurance plans in, uh, in OECD countries, there's been a, a, a literature review on this, there are no public insurance plans that vary cost sharing by drug. Usually it just says, you know, particular cost sharing, say in, in, in the VA setting, it's $8, no matter what you buy. It doesn't matter if it's a statin or if it's a, a more expensive drug. On the other hand, if you think about your private insurance plan, even though we all may know, not know what exactly is the copay for a drug, but we probably have a sense that it's going to vary a little bit across drugs, and there is this idea of formularies and tiers, and it's, it's sort of much more complicated. So private and public insurers here seem to be behaving in very different ways. So in this paper, we uh, decided to just ask a very simple question, which is, does it appear that insurers behave in this Medicare Part D setting, because that's a setting where we observe a lot of different insurers making these decisions, do they actually set higher cost sharing for things that are more price responsive? So do they behave as theory would suggest here? Um, so that's a very descriptive question, and then I'll tell you kind of our normative judgment on this. So to do this, we first had to figure out how responsive people are to various, uh, how, respon how, how difference, different is responsiveness to prices across different drugs. So the first exercise that we do in this paper is we actually take 160 drugs and 100 therapeutic classes and estimate how people respond to changes in prices. We find substantial differences in these responses, and it seems that some of these differences are intuitive and potentially concerning if you're a physician. So people seem to be much less responsive for things that cover acute conditions, which makes sense. We find very little demand elasticity for uh, uh, opioid medication or in general pain medication. We find fairly substantial elasticity for things for, that, are, uh, that are usually prescribed for chronic conditions. So again, as was mentioned before, if you'd stop taking your and tomorrow you're probably not going to have a heart attack next week. So it makes kind of intuitive sense that people may uh, not internalize the long-term benefit and discontinue taking their drugs when faced with a higher cost in the short run. So in addition, then we look at whether how plans set cost sharing across these different drugs. And interestingly, and potentially surprisingly for us ourselves, we find that indeed it is the case that this Medicare Part D plans end up setting higher cost sharing for drugs that are more responsive. And you can already start thinking about all the possible reasons this may or may not be a good thing. So let me first uh, give you a couple of ideas of how we do that and show you some pictures rather than just text. So actually estimating how responsive people are to things is, uh, uh, to prices is, is, uh, is kind of a challenging task because we don't often observe a lot of variation in prices. So what we do here is we use this donut hole idea in Medicare Part D. So Medicare Part D, and I haven't shown you kind of a broad description, but it, you can think about this as if you are a senior enrolled in Medicare Part D, you have insurance coverage, you spend on drugs, you spend, spend, spend throughout the year, and at some point, 
you reach a threshold in spending where your insurance stops and says, you know, for the next $5,000 in spending, you don't have any insurance, and then we'll kind of, re you know, continue again once you've reached that high threshold of spending. So I hope that makes sense. Basically, you know, suppose you've spent two and a half thousand dollars, and that point was reached in July, then Medicare Part D plan is going to say, okay, for the next two and a half thousand dollars, you have to pay for everything out of pocket. We're not going to provide you with coverage. Okay, so that is called a donut hole, and there are various reasons for why that was kind of the design of the program. For our purposes, the interesting thing here is that once you've reached that threshold, your price essentially overnight increases by a lot. And we can use that increase in price to estimate how people respond in their, uh, in, in their probability of purchasing drugs when they face this increase in price. So what we do in this graph, and I'm going to show you several of this just to illustrate the point that it varies across drugs, what I do here is we um, order people, we calculate basically what is your annual spending on drugs and how does that relate to this threshold where you would fall into this coverage gap, okay? And so the x-axis here is your total spending on drugs per year, but it's centered around this threshold. So when you see zero on the x-axis, this means that those are people who spent exactly enough to fall into this, into this gap in, in, in when their coverage stopped. And then if you see minus 1,000, this means that these were people who spent 1,000 less than the threshold. And on the x, uh, on, sorry, on the y-axis here, we're plotting the probability that a person purchases a particular drug, in this case, statins. So this is a class level, therapeutic class level analysis. And what you see here is that, so there is in general an increase in trend, which makes sense, because as we go to the right on the x-axis, people are becoming sicker since they're spending more and more on drugs. And so the probability that they take a statin in general is increasing uh, as we go to the right. But at the same time, you see this very distinct change in behavior around zero, which is where people hit the coverage and the gap, their insurance stops, and they have to pay for drugs out of pocket. Okay, and what essentially we do in the paper to estimate these responses, so we're going to essentially estimate the vertical distance of this drop and see how that relates to the change in prices that people experience for this drug at this point in time. And then basically for each drug and therapeutic class, calculate how much does your probability of purchasing a drug go down for 1% increase in price, okay? And so we're gonna do that for various drugs. You can see pictorial that the responses are very different. So this is ACE inhibitors. The picture looks very different. It's on the same scale. The response is much less pronounced and there is actually no general upward trend over time, uh, over different spending levels. This is a similar picture for, uh, for a populostatin generic. There is some drop in response, but you can see where I'm going. Basically, we're gonna plot 160 of this, drug, of this therapeutic class pictures and 100 for drugs. I'm not promised not to show you 260 pictures. And then we do this calculation so as to calculate how different the responsiveness is across different drugs and therapeutic classes. And we find that there is some heterogeneity. So here I'm just plotting a histogram of the various values for that we found for each therapeutic class. Um, and we find that the average elasticity of demand here is minus 0.14. What does this mean? This means for a 1% on average, for a 1% increase in price, the probability that people uh, uh, buy a drug drops by 1.4%. Uh, I'm sorry, by 0.114%. Um, okay. And then for drugs, we see similar dispersion and the average elasticity here is somewhat higher because within therapeutic classes, you're sort of subsuming substitution between branded and generic drugs or substitution across uh, drugs within the same therapeutic class. For uh, drug-specific elasticities, this number is somewhat higher. So here we estimate, let me try this again with a, without the points, uh, for a 10% increase in, uh, in, in uh, price, the probability that you buy a drug goes down by 2.4%, uh, okay? So this means economists would call this product fairly inelastic in the sense that if you have a very elastic product, then the response is much higher than the increase in price. But still, there is, the point here is that there is uh, substantial differences across different drugs. So then we take all of these numbers and um, 
ask what do plants do with them, if anything. In some sense, we're not literally asking, you know, do plants calculate elasticities and then set prices? Of course, they don't do that. But at the end of the day, when we look at the data, are there particular relationships between cost sharing and, uh, and these elasticities of demand for these drugs? And we find that, um, indeed, it seems that plants set higher cost sharing for more elastic drugs. So on the x-axis here, I'm plotting our estimated elasticity. On the y-axis, the average core insurance rate and the dots here are just weighted by the, uh, the sort of the frequency of particular drugs. And you can see here, and you can kind of more convincingly see this in regressions for those of you who are academics in the audience, uh, we estimate that indeed plants set higher cost sharing for more elastic drugs. So what are the policy implications of this? In some sense, who cares? Um, so they do, and, and, and so what? Um, so this finding is consistent with incentives of private profit maximizing firms. As I've already mentioned to you at the beginning, essentially economic theory would predict that firms should do this. The problem is though, of course, the normative conclusions here are ambiguous in the sense, should we feel good or bad about the fact that firms do this? Because if you think that patients don't internalize drug benefits, so this is in stark contrast to this idea of value-based care or value-based insurance where it's sort of the value comes somewhere externally. The physician or the, some organization is going to tell you what is the kind of high value care and what is low value care. While here we're estimating in some sense the consumer response and consumer valuation of these things, which may or may not be consistent with what the medical profession would tell us. So if you believe that patients don't internalize the benefit completely, for example, they, you know, even though they don't have, get a heart attack tomorrow, it's still bad not to take uh, their statins, then you may be worried about the fact that these plans are setting high cost sharing for those drugs and that potentially may be, uh, may actually be high value drugs. On the other hand, you know, that really depends, your normative judgment really depends on what you think about uh, whether patients, uh, patient behavior, is it sort of representing something that we should care about or should we say that, you know, patients may not necessarily have full information to make these decisions. So it's um, better to have sort of value-based insurance where it is the sort of, a, uh, you know, m clinical trials and medical knowledge that is driving cost sharing rather than uh, sort of how responsive people are to, to prices. So that's something I think we would have to um, think about when uh, uh, designing policy. Okay, and so finally, uh, let me now do another jump um, and spend five minutes <laughs> on talking about the government design of subsidization policies. So in essence, as I've mentioned, my view of how this program works is essentially the government is you know, designing a market here and then lets these private players operate on it. But of course, this means that the way the government chooses to design things has a large influence of what consumers and insurers do. And here, this is kind of has been my favorite topic over the uh, last couple of years, is thinking about what is the role of subsidization design per se on how these programs operate. So as I've mentioned, Medicare Part D is highly subsidized. You can kind of think as a ballpark Park, about 75% of revenues in this market come from federal funding. And the very basic and kind of naive question is, how does the government actually figure out how much subsidies to pay? So setting aside any political considerations, even if you were sort of writing, you know, your theoretical economic social planners model in, in locked up in a room that was not influenced by any politics, it is very hard to figure out what exactly should the government do in terms of subsidizing this program. And in addition to that, whether there are differences in the various subsidization mechanisms that affect how consumers behave, that affect how insurance behave, and, and that may have profound effects on the efficiency of this program as a whole. Why do I think that's an interesting question? Is because um, if you think about how the government is spending money on healthcare, uh, over the past 10 years, from, so, so if you take all spending on Medicare and Medicaid, the share of spending that is attributed to subsidies to private insurance entities as opposed to direct payments to providers like is done in traditional Medicare actually doubled. So the government, in some sense, it makes sense because it is you know, safer for the budget to say, or less, there is less risk or uncertainty in the budget if you say we pay a certain amount to insurers and they figure out how to provide care for this amount, as opposed to saying, well, we'll cover for you know your hospitalization services and who knows how much this will cost at the end of the year. So given that 
there is this big shift in how the government is spending money, it seems important to understand what that may do to, to, the, uh, to the incentives in the market. And there is a very complicated system how Medicare Part D is subsidized. In the interest of time, I'm not going to give you too many details, but essentially you can think about sort of a multi-page formula that says, you know, insurers submit bids, then we average the bid, then we take 70% of the bid, we call that the subsidy, then we let, we risk adjust the subsidy, and then we let the consumer to pay the difference. So there is kind of a whole uh, a set of steps there that the government makes, and those are things that usually don't make it to the New York Times because I don't think anyone is interested in hearing about the formula for subsidization, but it actually is the formula that guides you know, how this $80 billion in federal spending on Medicare Part D are distributed across providers, uh, across uh, insurance plans and, and consumers. So, um, in, uh, uh, in this paper that I've written with some uh, uh, co-authors from Boston University, Francesco De Carolis and Stephen Ryan from uh, Washington University in St. Louis, what we set out to do is to write down a model, an economic model of how insurers and consumers are making choices in this market and try to simulate different subsidization policies. So that took some work. It makes a lot of assumptions that a lot of academics will not uh, like and, uh, and so forth. I'll spare you all of that. But what we basically basically find is actually um, potentially relatively surprising. So we think that this current policy, and as I've described to you, it's kind of complicated, the average things and they take ratio of things. It actually is close to this idea of an optimal voucher. So people, there is this, sort of this, this concept of vouchers is quite uh, popular in the policy debate about subsidies. Let us just give everyone a voucher. So it turns out what they're currently doing in Medicare Part D is close to an optimal voucher. What I mean by an optimal voucher is if you were to write down kind of an economic social planner's problem of how much subsidy you would give to people, uh, then the amount you would get is quite close to what they end up paying insurers today. You could make the system much more efficient by sort of giving each plan a different subsidy, but that is probably A, politically not feasible, but also in general not very practical because you would have to know a lot about the cost structure of each plan, which in principle Medicare does, but at the same time it still would be hard to implement. So the current system is not performing that badly. And um, I think one key lesson that we learned from this modeling exercise, what would be a really bad idea is to have proportional subsidies. So to, to basically say, you know, you insure set whatever prices and we'll just pay 50% of that price, that would be a really bad idea. And I'm guessing we don't really need a model to, to figure that out because insurers with market power will actually have an incentive to then raise prices to, in, to infinity. So that's just uh, a picture where we think about these different levels of vouchers. Um, let me skip that in the interest of time. So another key learning, and I'm going to wrap up here, that we uh, derive from this, uh, from this modeling exercise is that there are large differences in efficiency that you generate in the program depending on how you design the subsidy, whether you do vouchers, you do proportional subsidies, whether you vary vouchers by plans or by types of consumers or by geographic regions. So there are various uh, mechanisms that it can give you very different results. The thing that is important to keep in mind here is sort of we have to actually first say what is it that we want to achieve. So do we want to maximize social welfare in this program? That would be the sum of consumer surplus, producer surplus, and uh, taking into account government spending. Or maybe we only want to maximize consumer surplus, in which case we may actually want to offer uh, uh, proportional subsidies. Or maybe we want to minimize government spending, then you would want to do a different thing. So even within the context of suppose you fixed federal spending, you could still move around the program a lot and change who pays what in some sense and who gets su uh, which surplus depending on how you design the subsidy. Okay. So I think I have convinced you today that the government plays a central role in enabling access to drugs through insurance systems. So we haven't talked about drug prices today, but at the end of the day, you know, payment for drugs goes through insurance systems and the government plays a central role in facilitating that. Medicare Part D experience suggests that if we have consumer choices, we have to worry about lots of things like are consumers choosing the right plans? Is there adverse selection? Are there policies in place to counteract adverse selection? We also face very sophisticated insurers that are doing you know, many things and adjusting their plans to, make, to be as profitable as possible and kind of the normative debate of whether what they are doing is better or worse or 
or somehow desirable, then what the government would have done is, I think, still open. Um, and, I, and, and then there is this important point that we have to be cognizant of the boring things like subsidization mechanism may actually have profound effects on, on, uh, on the success of this program. Um, so I think this kind of opens the general theme that I'm sure um, uh, Richard will touch more about on this you know, private and public provision of insurance. The Affordable Care Act is right in the middle of this kind of general debate. So I'll uh, leave it there. Thank you for your attention. Hello. Uh, um, I had a question regarding your last topic about mm -hmm. um, subsidization design, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about what you were talking about, the difference between the voucher system and the propor yeah. proportion. And I think that's really relevant to the talk about the ACA currently, because the way the, yep. the, the um, advanced premium tax credit works, yep. it's proportional. I'm, uh, from what you describe, it seems to be that way, and what impact that has on the debate um, regarding increases in premiums and the exchanges and the talk about how despite the increase in the premiums, a lot of consumers are shielded from that increase. Mm -hmm. What impact does that have on government spending and those who are not eligible for the subsidies and mm -hmm. what economic impacts that have? So I was mm -hmm. curious if you can expound upon that point more. Um, yeah, well, so that's a broad and hard question. Um, so I think, in, in, in actually, with the same co-authors, we are writing a paper on subsidies in the ACA, but we haven't finished yet, so I cannot really tell you what we find. But I think the key issue is, so ACA actually doesn't have proportional subsidies. The subsidization mechanism in the exchanges is as involved as it is in Part D. It's somewhat different. So what they are trying to do there is they are trying to collect bids from uh, silver plans in each geographic, in, in each localized geographic market, and then they take uh, the second lowest bid only of the silver plans, and that bid, in addition to some income tiered caps of how much you're supposed to be paying for insurance is what determines the subsidy. So the subsidy essentially is sort of the difference between the second lower silver plan and the uh, income-based cap. So what we see there, and I, I guess I am, you know, since we're writing the paper, that is kind of a topic I'm quite excited about these days. What we see there is subsidies are linked to observables about people, which is income. So if I, as an insurer, know that I'm going to offer a plan in a fairly poor county where a lot of people will get a lot of subsidies because the subsidies are linked to income, then there, in fact, I have an insurance to raise, uh, to raise uh, I have an incentive to raise premiums. But in general, ACA premiums are not tied to, they're not uh, proportional or sort of not premium subsidies. Um, and I think, you know, it is, it, it's kind of without doing data analysis, it's very hard to say what this what this specific structure with the second lower silver plan and so forth, what it does to whether that has anything to do with the increase in premiums. But it is true that in general, the statement that you know premiums go up, that doesn't actually mean that effective premiums that people pay uh, go up. And there is kind of a, a complicated uh, formula that links the two. And it's hard to sort of say by just looking at it, uh, what's, what's the, what, what does it do? Yeah, but thank you for the question. I know you have mentioned met the government spent 75 per or reimbursed 75 percent of the spending already, but is purely run by private insurance. Mm -hmm. Is there any plan for CMS to run the Part D? <laughs> uh, I think I'm not qualified to answer that question. Maybe some uh, colleagues who had experience in the government would be uh, more qualified to answer that. So, to the best of my knowledge, ex actually, when Medicare Part D was uh, uh, sort of conceived, there was some idea of offering a so-called public option um, in Medicare Part D, but that has been not implemented, and I don't think there is, there's been some debate on and off about the kind of offering public option in Medicare Part D, but I don't believe it's currently kind of acutely on, 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 the, on, the, on the table, uh, because the program has been, you know, fairly stable. That's why we don't really hear about it much in the, in the press, yeah. Hi, uh, 
So if I heard you correctly, uh, right here. Oh, yeah, okay, here. sorry. The <laughs> microphone is coming from the same <laughs> direction, no matter where I'm the hiding. Um, the So what I, what I heard was that subsidy spending by CMS has shifted from paying hospitals and doctors to paying private insurance companies <clears throat> under this Medicare Part D. Mm -hmm. and why, why is that? Um, so, so that's not just because of Medicare Part D, but that is actually primarily driven by this Medicare Advantage uh, idea. So essentially seniors are given a choice of whether you want to be in traditional fee-for-service Medicare or whether you want to enroll in a privately run Medicare Advantage plan. That plan will also happen to usually offer prescription drug benefits, but that's kind of not. And this Medicare Advantage program has existed for decades, and it has just grown quite dramatically over several, uh, over the last decade, essentially since the introduction of Medicare Part D, and maybe that has something to do with it. Um, and Medicare Advantage, the way it works is, you know, essentially, CMS says, we're going to give you, you know, some fixed amount to administer this uh, benefit for, for seniors who are now not going to be in traditional Medicare but are going to be in this private plan. And so if you know more, more and more people are enrolling in the private plans, that will just shift the government spending from traditional fee-for-service Medicare to paying these this subsidies, if you want to call them, or uh, to Medicare Advantage. Yeah. And by the way, so the same is true for Medicaid. So there's been a big move from Medicaid to, towards Medicaid managed care. So there's a similar example where you know we're not <clears throat> running the program directly, but rather paying private insurers to, to run it. Hi, over here. Um, yes. I had a two-part question. One is, uh, especially with the comparisons to the ACA, does Part D have a mandate to cover patients with pre-existing conditions? So that's the first question, if you mm -hmm. want to answer that first. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, well, it's, um, Part D only covers drugs, mm -hmm. so sort of conditions is not a well-defined yeah. object here, I guess. Uh, but yes, yeah, so Medicare Part D has to accept anyone who, okay. uh, Medicare Part D plans have to accept enrollment by anyone who wishes to enroll. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then the second half to that is, uh, I know you did, in the second part of your talk, you do analysis on change of behavior then for classes of drugs, uh, mm -hmm. do those include specialty drugs, or, or did you do an analysis of specialty drugs? So I'm thinking of patients with critical conditions that, right. regardless, are going to need um, that drug. Uh, yeah, so that, that's a good question. So unfortunately, the kind of specialty drugs, by definition, are drugs that are quite rarely taken. So our analysis relies on having a lot of data at every point of different spending distributions. So we were only able to do it. So basically, our 160 drugs were just the top 160 drugs by spending, because otherwise we get into, you know, there is very little data to, to do this kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. Why, um, this may be a political question, but I'm not sure. Why does Medicare pay more to the Medicare Advantage plans than they would for, for traditional Medicare for the cost of providing care to that population. They, it's my understanding they give a 15% or more um, uh, premium to the Medicare Advantage plans than they would pay for traditional Medicare. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is somewhat of a political question, I guess. I, I mean, that just relates to the history of Medicare Advantage, um, because the program was very slow to start at the beginning. You know, people thought that maybe if we increase reimbursement for them, they would be able to provide better benefits and, en and enroll more people. That has actually been, um, uh, I believe, I don't work on Medicare Advantage, so don't take that for a very correct answer, but I believe that was actually cut uh, in, okay, my, uh, the speaker's table is nodding, so that's good. Uh, so, so the Medicare Advantage kind of premium uh, over traditional Medicare was cut uh, as part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, so that's kind of a moving target, and that goes, goes back to this fundamental question, though. You know, how do you figure out how much to pay? If you suppose you decide you want to pay private insurers this sort of public subsidy, how do you figure out the amount? And there's been kind of very little work, for, uh, as far as I can tell, in, in trying to understand the implications of, of these decisions. People are ready for the break. 
Thank you very much.